Hey y'all, welcome back to my channel. In this video, we're going to be doing some meal prepping, meal planning for the whole entire week, and I'm going to be providing you five easy weeknight meals to cook for your families during this quarantine, or whenever really, because these are really simple meals that you can make. I do have some recipes uh, for each of the meals that I'm making that I can link down below. Either the entire recipe or just a portion of it was inspired by some recipes that I found on Pinterest, so I'll be sure to link those below so that you can go to Pinterest and follow along those recipes. As you can see here, I'm getting all of my ingredients together for the items that I'm gonna need to buy from the store this week. And this is basically how I plan and prep every single week for the meals that we're going to be cooking. I take a look at my calendar, what we've got going on. I use my whiteboards. As you can see there, I've got my weekly meal plan on the little whiteboard and then my calendar off to the right there. I have a bunch of markers and it's a little embarrassing. The way that I keep all of this organized is I separate my dry erase from my wet erase markers and it just helps keep things really nice and neat on my refrigerator, which we use as our command center basically. So. I'm going to um, get all of my grocery items on this list, go through my pantry and my refrigerator, see what things I do have already, and then cross off what I don't need, and we'll just get the things that we do need from the store this week. Our first recipe is gonna be the KFC Famous Bowl Copycat. I made the chicken based off of a recipe that I already knew, which is just dredging it in flour, seasoned flour, and then fr uh, shallow frying it in a pan with um, about a quarter inch of oil in it. But the recipe that I pulled from Pinterest was the gravy. Oh my goodness. I've never tasted gravy so good. It literally tastes exactly like KFC gravy. So let's get into this recipe. So here I'm basically just cleaning up this chicken, taking off all the fatty parts and cutting it into bite-sized pieces and preparing it for the frying pan. Next, I'm moving on to the potatoes and peeling them pretty roughly. It's a thin skin potato, so I really don't wanna get every single bit off. I usually yield about one medium-sized potato per adult or half a potato per kid. So I've got, what, five potatoes here? Something like that, um, to make the mashed potatoes for the bowl. Then I'm just gonna cut those up into small pieces. I wanna try and keep the pieces relatively similar in size so that they cut even so they cook evenly and uh, quickly. If they're chunked up super big, it's gonna take a while for them to cook. Next, we're just gonna throw them on the stove and a pot of salted water and get our oil started. You want about mm, maybe an eighth to a quarter inch in the bottom of your skillet of uh, vegetable oil, peanut oil, whichever. And then I just dumped some flour, I think it's about a cup of flour, maybe, with some seasonings. I'm gonna use, excuse me, I'm using garlic, adobo, and a touch of cayenne, salt and pepper. And you're gonna wanna adjust your seasonings accordingly. Um, I didn't test it in this particular video, and I usually do, I don't know why I didn't, but I usually just take one piece of chicken, dredge it, fry it up, and taste it to see if my seasoning is where I want it to be. I very rarely actually measure seasonings just because cooking is all based off of preference and flavor. So um, I did fry up the first batch, realized that it wasn't exactly to my liking, it was a little bland, so I added some more of all of the seasonings just to give it that extra flavor. Next up, we're gonna start making a little bit of a roux for the gravy. Start off with butter in the pan, get it melted down, and then we're gonna be throwing in a beef uh, bouillon cube. I decided to throw two in, I didn't uh, put it in, um, but once I was tasting it, excuse me, tasting it at the very end, I realized that it just didn't have the depth of flavor that, that I was used to from KFC. Um, so I threw in an extra beef bouillon cube and just an extra bit of sage at the very end and it really elevated it to the next level. It was so good. So you're going to want to melt that in. I switched from a fork down to a whisk uh, just because the cube that I had was a little bit more consolidated. It wasn't really powdery. It was more, I don't know, compacted, I don't know, whatever. So um, I switched over to a metal whisk and then I dumped the flour in 
I didn't let mine brown up enough, so I had a very blonde roux. So you're definitely gonna wanna let it sit on the stove and cook for a minute just to get that floury taste out of it and to have it darken up a bit before you go and pour your chicken stock in. By now my potatoes are done cooking, so I'm taking a hand mixer and just blending them up and breaking them down a little bit more. I'm gonna be adding butter to the pot along with garlic powder and a tablespoon of mayo. Yes, mayo. Trust me on this one. I promise you, it will just take your potatoes to the next level. Um, salt and pepper to flavor, uh, or to taste as well. A lot of people use milk instead of mayo. I just find that the mayo gives it a creamy texture and you really can't taste it. It mixes right in. It doesn't have like a mayonnaise -y taste. It's just a creaminess factor and oh my goodness, the next level mashed potatoes, let me tell you. After all the chicken's done cooking, we've got our final product here. Just put a little bit of uh, cooked corn, um, shredded cheese, and top it with the chicken and the gravy. And there's like mashed potatoes underneath that, so. And then the biscuit, we cheated and we went out and got KFC biscuits. <laughs> but you can cook up any kind of biscuit you want. Our next recipe is gonna be this meatloaf and mac and cheese. The mac and cheese recipe I got off of Pinterest. The meatloaf is my recipe. I'll include the details of it down below just so that you have something to reference because I know I kind of go fast through here and it's hard to write things down quickly. <laughs> so the first thing we're doing was we're chopping up, um, I would say a half an onion. We absolutely love onions, so I used three quarters of a medium sized onion. Uh, when I was blending everything together, it was quite a bit of onion. I think I probably would have stuck with the half just because it didn't really, the meat didn't hold together as well as I would have liked. If you're wondering what that green thing is, it's an onion saver. I have no idea where my grandma got it, but she got it for me back when I was a teenager and I really started getting into cooking. Um, so it's an onion saver. You can probably find one on Amazon, honestly, and it's really cool to hold in the fridge. The next thing I'm adding are two pounds of ground beef. Um, if you saw my previous video, you may have seen me packaging this ground beef up. We got six pounds of it and froze most of it, so we just take it out as we need it. I'm also adding mozzarella and Parmesan cheese. I'm not measuring, honestly. I think I did a handful of both of them. But I used cheese instead of egg and um, breadcrumbs because I think that it provides more moisture instead of drying the meatloaf out and this really does help with binding everything together and just using cheese instead of egg and breadcrumbs. I was having trouble <laughs> grating it into the bowl so I just kind of went off to the side, grated some fresh parmesan and then dumped it in. So there you go. This next round is going to be a speed round of spices. So we're going to be dumping in some parsley, Montreal steak seasoning. I use the McCormick's brand. Um, Italian seasoning. I think this one was from Aldi's. Let's see what's next. Garlic salt. This is the Lowry's brand. And this is where I get my salt content in the um, meatloaf. That is garlic powder, just because the garlic salt doesn't have as much garlic flavor in it as I would like, and I don't want to dump an entire container of salt in there. Um, also for moisture and a salt flavor to it as well, we add in a sprinkling of soy sauce, a squirt of tomato paste, and what's next, barbecue sauce? Yeah, barbecue sauce. And then just a squirt of barbecue, so <laughs> Ugh, barbecue sauce, and all of this just adds moisture and flavor to the meatloaf. I'm gonna get in there and mix it all up.
So once I get the meatloaf's formed, I'm going to squirt a bit of the barbecue sauce into a little ramekin and take my basting brush and just kind of brush the outsides of the meatloaf. This is gonna give it one flavor and two, it's going to help the outsides from to keep from drying out and burning. A lot of people use ketchup or tomato sauce or tomato paste on the outside. We just find that we like the flavor of the barbecue sauce a lot better on the meatloaf. Next, we're gonna cover it up with some tin foil and pop it in the oven uh, for about an hour or you know, check it after 45 minutes and see if it's done or not. Um, we had popped ours in with the mac and cheese and realized that it was not cooking quick enough. I guess too many things in the oven at once, so. Uh, water's boiling for the noodles. I'm going to cook two and a half cups of macaroni noodles first and drain them. And then we're shredding, I had, what is that, a one pound block, two pound block of cheese, uh, mild cheddar. Uh, we only need three cups of it though, so we reserved some of it and we used that on tacos the, was it the next night? Yeah, the next night. You'll see that I have some white sharp cheddar off to the side there because I wasn't sure if I was going to need more cheese. This turned out to be absolutely perfect and we really like the flavor of the mild cheddar instead of the sharp. Even though we love eating sharp cheddar on the side like by itself and even in macaroni and cheese dishes, this was absolutely perfect. The flavor was phenomenal. Next, you're gonna definitely want to spray down whatever baking dish you're using. I honestly don't even know the dimensions of this one. It just looks like it would be big enough. So you're gonna dump half of the pasta into the bottom of the um, oiled baking pan. This is the flour mixture in the recipe that you dump half of that on top and sprinkle it across the, all of the pasta. And then layer that with butter. Honestly, if you're not into butter, we're using a Paula Deen amount of butter in this dish, so <laughs> buyer beware. Next, after the butter, we're going to be putting on a layer of half of the shredded cheese, and then we're going to be repeating those steps with macaroni, flour, butter, and then cheese again. I forgot the butter on the last part, so I just kind of plopped it on the top and it turned out just fine. And if anything, it made it even crispier on top and it was so good. Oh yeah, by the way, we added some chopped bacon pieces like for salads in there too because the guys wanted bacon and macaroni and cheese and I couldn't say no. Then once it's all assembled and you have all of your layers together, you're going to take the one cup of milk and just kind of pour it over everything. I wanted to focus on any of the exposed bits of flour um, just to make sure that it was getting absorbed by the milk because that's what's gonna give it the creamy texture within and kind of create, I don't know, basically like a roux within your mac and cheese. I, I assume that that's what the, what the milk is for, but 
Y'all, this is literally the most delicious mac and cheese that I think we've ever had. It's not a creamy mac and cheese. It's definitely a baked mac and cheese. And if you wanted to, you could definitely add like a panko breadcrumb on top of this to give it like that baked mac and cheese classic look and texture to it. But this was so stinking good. Let me tell you. When you tent, or I'm sorry, when you cover your mac and cheese with foil, cause you wanna cover it um, and cook it covered first, make sure that you tent it down the center so that your foil is not touching the cheese. Once you take the foil off after it's been in the oven, if it's not tented, your cheese is gonna stick to your foil and then you've just got a bunch of wrapper cheese and not a pretty looking dish. So I would highly suggest to pinch your foil in the center and bring it up into a tent so that it doesn't stick to the cheese. And here's our final product. These are our meat loaves. We used an 85-15 blend of meat versus fat and it gave off quite a bit of grease. We usually use extra lean, but they didn't have it when we went to the store. And then here's our nice bubbly mac and cheese. The next thing we're gonna make is a guacamole pico de gallo and a black bean and corn salsa. And these are all just my personal recipes for them. So I'm going to be chopping up quite a bit of the ingredients um, to throw in all of three of them. The thing that I'm showing you here is a guacamole bowl and it is the coolest thing ever. I'll link it down in the description box below, but it basically seals off the top layer of your guacamole so that it doesn't get brown and it keeps in the fridge so well. So the first, so the first thing we're gonna be doing here is chopping up a red onion for all three dishes. I think I used about a half of a red onion for all three of them. And again, it's just based on personal preference. If you really like onion, use more. If you really dislike onion, use less. So it's all based on what you really like in your guacamole, pico, and uh, black bean and corn salsa. I know I'm gonna have so many like actual chefs out there tell me you're chopping wrong, you're gonna cut your fingers off. I, this is how I learned how to cut. <laughs> I haven't chopped off a finger yet. Um, I do know that the worst tool in your kitchen is a dull knife, so I do keep my knives pretty sharp and I keep my fingers out of the way. Um, and this is just the way that I chop onions to get the most even dice that I possibly can. So you chop onions however you feel like chopping onions. <laughs> So once I get them all chopped up, I'm just gonna put them into a bowl off to the side um, just so that I can sprinkle them into each of the dishes as I make them. And it's gonna kind of be all over the place, so just bear with me. <laughs> the next thing I'm doing is cutting the avocados in half by placing the blade all the way down to the pit and running it around the pit on the inside and then stabbing the pit with the butt of the knife and twisting. And that's how you get the pit out of an avocado. Sometimes if the avocado is, is not quite ripe enough like it was here, it can be really difficult and you might split the pit a couple of times. Just place the blade, the butt of your knife into another part of the pit and keep trying it until you get it out. If you have to, you can just use a spoon and scoop it out. This is just the easiest way that i found to do it without losing too much of the avocado to the pit. And then I'll just take the tip of my knife, run it along the inside. You could do this with a butter knife if you worry about cutting through the skin of the avocado into your hand. Um, I'm just being really gentle here and not even putting too much pressure. And I'm just scoring the avocado all the way through so that once I take it out with a fork, it's already pretty much chunked up. One thing I wanna note is if you like your avocado more chunky, then I wouldn't stir it until the very end because the more you stir and mix it around, the more broken up the chunks of avocado are gonna be. If you like a really well blended guacamole, then you can start mashing it up from the beginning. I kind of like chunks of avocado in my guacamole, so I'm just gonna leave it and add ingredients as I chop them up, and we'll just mix it all together at the end. The next thing I'm adding in is this jalapeno. I used about a half. Um, I do remove the rib and the seeds from it just because my kids like guacamole and they don't like too much spice. So I do take the spicy parts out of the jalapeno, but I still wanna keep that jalapeno flavor, so I will add a little bit into each of the dishes. And again, just slicing it down, this would be considered a julienne if we're being technical and fancy here. Actually, it's a little bit thicker than a julienne, but anyways, this is the easiest way that I've found to keep the pieces relatively similar in size. And then again, I'm gonna be chopping up the rest of this jalapeno and reserving it for the other dishes. Um, the jalapeno that I just threw in went into the guacamole bowl, 
And then I think I'm gonna save all of this for the black bean and corn salsa. I don't remember putting any in the pico de gallo just because my son really dislikes jalapenos or spicy food and he loves pico. So I kind of catered to his taste buds today and didn't put any um, jalapeno in the pico de gallo for him. So here I'm just throwing in a little bit of the onion into the guacamole and mixing it around just to see what we're looking like here. I base mine off of visual because I know the ratio of red onion to green pepper, green pepper and jalapeno pepper and the cilantro that I'm gonna be putting in here in just a second after the tomatoes. And that's how I basically season my guacamole. So here I've got three Roma tomatoes. These are my favorite for making pico de gallo just because they've got more of a firmer flesh and the seeds are a lot easier to remove. I don't like seeds of a tomato. Actually, I, I won't eat a tomato with seeds in it just because the seeds gross me out. So I will de-seed a tomato every time that I use it, whether it's for salad or pico or any time that I use a tomato and it's raw, I will take the seeds out. <laughs> I know, I'm probably weird, whatever. It is what it is. So I'm just de-seeding these, taking out the whiter portions. They're not as sweet, they're a little bitter. So I'm chopping those out. And then once these are all um, de-seeded, I'm going to slice them into thin slices and chop them into similar pieces, kind of like what I did with the jalapeno pepper. And again, just dumping some of the red onion into the pico, and I'm gonna rinse off my cutting board because tomato juices and cilantro, you know. Anyways, so we're gonna be chopping off the heads of a cilantro, just the leafy parts. Any big stems I'll go ahead and pick out. I did see one later on that I'll be picking out of there, but just chopping up a giant head of rinsed cilantro. Then I'll be splitting that into three parts just for the three different dishes. A pinch for the pico, a pinch for the guac, and then I'll reserve the rest for the black bean and corn salsa, which I'll be making next. For this, I just use canned corn and canned black beans. The corn I don't typically rinse. I'll just dump it in there to drain off the liquid that is in the can. And when I make this at home, I just do half a can of each um, because it's just too much for my family to eat all at once. And then I'll just stick the remainder of the can in a Ziploc bag, a small Ziploc bag, and we'll make it and use it for next week's tacos. We make this almost every single week that we have tacos. So here I've got my bowl of black beans and corn and I'm putting in that chopped cilantro. I'm also adding, what am I adding next? The onions, quite a bit of those. I reserved some for the guys who want extra onions on their tacos. Um, and then I'm dumping all of those jalapenos in there as well. The next thing that I'm adding to all three dishes actually is lime juice. I just use the squeeze bottle because we go through so much lime juice that it'd be ridiculous to sit here and squeeze limes all day long, even though fresh lime juice is always more preferred. So I'll use um, a couple spins around the bowl of lime juice, shake in some ground cumin, salt and pepper to taste, and that is it for the black bean and corn salsa. And actually, that's it for all of the recipes. It's just lime juice, cumin, ground cumin, salt and pepper to taste. And just mix them up, cover them, put them in the refrigerator until it's time for dinner. Or you can have a little snack right now with just a little tortilla chip. See right here, I'm taste testing. <laughs> and that's how I basically cook is just taste testing all of my recipes until they're the desired flavor profile that I'm looking for. These cute little rubber lids, I also found these on Amazon. They were a recommendation from Jessica Braun. Um, she has a vlog channel with her husband as well, and I think they discussed it 
discuss these in one of those vlogs. I got a pack and I actually really like them. They only fit a couple of my bowls and there's not multiple sizes in a pack. So if you have multiple bowls of the same size, you'll have to get multiple packs to cover them. But so far so good. They fit this white bowl and the other white bowl that I just showed. Way to go. You just threw all the food everywhere. I also want to apologize for me blocking the camera constantly. <laughs> I'm right-handed and I can't do hardly anything with my left hand. So I really need to remember to put the camera on the left side of what I'm doing so that I'm not blocking and you can't see anything. <laughs> This is also so satisfying, just kind of squishing down on your avocado or your guacamole and having it all fit into that bowl perfectly. Look at that, perfect seal. I mean, you get some up on the rim, but it's perfect seal. So I've got a pound of ground beef in the skillet and a cup of rice up there. We just seasoned that with adobo, maybe some sasson seasoning. I didn't use sasson this time, but whatever. Um, browning up the ground beef. Again, it's an 85-15 blend. A um, little bit greasier than we usually like, so I think I did strain off just a little bit of the grease. This is a taco seasoning packet from Aldi's. I'll dump the whole thing in there and then go fill that up uh, about three quarters of the way with water and mix all of that together and get like a nice taco -y sauce. And then once all of that is nice and mixed and combined, I'll shut off the heat and move on over to our tortillas. This is the best way that we found to make some nice, chewy, crunchy, crispy, not overly fluffy and microwaved flour tortilla. And then here's all of our toppings and sides. My next recipe is going to be this chicken alfredo. The entire um, recipe is going to be linked below in a Pinterest link. That's where I got it from. I think I cooked my chicken differently than what they had said to do in the recipe just because I found this to be the easiest way. I put three chicken breasts in a crock pot with what was left over of a box of chicken stock from earlier on in the week. I'll sprinkle in some Pit Boss Champion Chicken. We got this from the grilling section of Walmart. We have literally every single one of those seasonings. One day I'm going to have to clean out my Lazy Susan that's right down there below where my crock pot is. My goodness, when I tell you that we're like mad scientists in the kitchen with all these seasonings, it's no joke. <laughs> Um, also adding garlic powder to this, the Southern Blend by, what is it, Badia, and then a touch of cayenne. Kicking it on high, I think it's about noon when I started it, so I gave it a good four or five hours on high. Boiling our penne pasta in salted water um, until that's al dente. We're going to begin making our roux for the bechamel. Those are water spots in the bottom of my pan. For some reason, my dishwasher doesn't like to dry my dishes all the way. But we're melting our butter down and throwing in a tablespoon of uh, minced garlic in with that and letting that cook for about 30 seconds. You wanna pretty much constantly stir that so that your minced garlic does not burn. It's not a good taste when you have burnt garlic in your dish, let me tell you. But once that's cooked for about 30 seconds, um, we're going to be throwing in the flour and whisking that together to make a roux and we're going to be pouring in the heavy cream to start building that sauce up. Um, I pour in about a half of the, con uh, the container just to get all of the flour and butter incorporated and then I'll pour the rest in 
to help that thicken up uh, more evenly so you don't have chunks of your roux floating throughout your cream. And that's heavy whipping cream right there. I did make this once before and it was all milk and it turned out really well. So you could just use three cups of milk or one cup of heavy cream and two cups of milk. Then you're gonna add in your Parmesan cheese. I think it was like one cup of Parmesan cheese. Again, the link down below for the entire recipe is in the description box. The only thing that I did differently is uh, the way that I cooked the chicken. And then, great measuring, two handfuls of mozzarella cheese. You can grate fresh mozzarella cheese. I was kind of in a pinch, so I just used whatever I had in the fridge and it was just pre-shredded mozzarella cheese. It turned out just fine. It didn't have a grainy texture to it at all. It was really good. So once this is nice and thickened and the cheese has just melted, we are going to go and grab our pasta. Oh, before we add the pasta, it's definitely important to taste this as well. So I grabbed a little spoon there and I was just tasting and adding more seasoning as I felt the need to. Yes, I did rinse that spoon before I put it back in the sauce because that's gross. And now we're gonna add in the pasta. The chicken had cooked for about five to six hours on high and then I took it out for probably about a half an hour to let it cool down so that I could shred it with my fingers. There's probably about three cups of chicken there. Honestly, this time the sauce was just not enough for all this pasta and chicken so I would cut it down to two cups or whatever the recipe says. I honestly didn't even follow the recipe. I just kind of dumped. <laughs> So definitely follow the recipe for the proper sauce to chicken to pasta ratio. And then we just top it with some more mo uh, mozzarella cheese and pop it in the oven for 20 minutes uncovered so that it can get nice and brown and bubbly. Then you shake some dried parsley on top and we served ours with salads that night. And that is our chicken Alfredo. Our next dish is gonna be this garlic uh, beef lo mein. We hadn't made this before, so this was a tester night. <laughs> My son really likes raw vegetables. He was not a fan of them cooked though, and this was a struggle to get them to eat this night, but as adults, we loved it. So this is definitely a, a crowd pleaser for adults. So I just chopped up, or I sliced up a um, green pepper, green bell pepper there. I'm also cleaning off the tops of some portobello mushrooms and slicing them into slices. The recipe that I've linked below calls for matchstick carrots um, and broccoli florets, but we just used the vegetables that we had on hand. And it honestly, it turned out delicious. I think that it would taste really good with any stir fry vegetables that you could possibly put in there. So we did green peppers, um, portobello mushrooms, a white onion, and snow peas. I think it was. I would suggest, look at that little stinker taking my veggies. <laughs> I would suggest like the sugar snap peas, the flat ones with the smaller beans in them, just because they maintain the <laughs> their texture a lot better than these snow peas did. I did steam them in the bag first, which I, they probably would have been a lot better off if I had just thrown them in there frozen and cooked them with the rest of the vegetables. But anyways, so uh, just slicing this onion up, keeping the little half ringlets and tossing them off to the side with the rest of the cut raw vegetables, which we'll be cooking here in just a bit. Um, I also did this off camera. I thought I had filmed it, but I guess I didn't. I cut my steak into quarter inch strips like the recipe says to do, and then I seasoned it, well, marinated it, there you go. Marinated it in some soy sauce, which I found interesting because we do that all the time with our steaks. So this is the sauce that they have you reserve off to the side for pouring over everything once it's done. It's two tablespoons of soy sauce, two tablespoons of hoisin sauce, a quarter cup of brown sugar, and I think it's like a half a teaspoon of ground ginger, and then a teaspoon of sesame oil, all mixed together and then set off to the side until everything's done, and then you pour it on top.
After that, I'm just pouring a little bit of sesame oil into a heated skillet and putting my seasoned or marinated steak into it to start browning. I'm also going to throw the raw vegetables in there with the steak so that they can start to soften as well. We really wanted the mushrooms and the peppers to break down a little bit more. Um, that's why I threw the vegetables in there with the steak rather than after the steak had already been cooked. Then once it's all cooked, just put your um, noodles in that have already been cooked and drained in with all of the vegetables and the meat and then pour your hoisin sauce over top of everything, stir it up, put it in a bowl, sprinkle some sesame seeds on top, and there you go. Thank you guys so much for watching this video with me. If you have any suggestions on any more videos that you'd like to watch, leave them in a comment below. I'll be posting more of these later on down the road.